All right, so this is lecture four in number theory. Um, <clears throat> and I was asked to do exercise 25 in section 1.2, which is to show that a certain set of matrices is an abelian group. So let's just recall the definition. Okay. So <clears throat> a um, group is a set G with a binary operation. Sometimes it's written as addition, sometimes it's written as, as multiplication, uh, sometimes it's something different. With the binary operation, I'll just use the symbol star asterisk to denote the binary operation that satisfies the following properties. So first, associativity. So if you take X times or A times B times C, that's the same as A times B times C for all A, B, C in the set G. Second, there exists an identity element. E, let's call it, in G, such that E times A and A times E is equal to A for all A in the group. Third, existence of inverses for all A in the group There exists a B in the group such that A times B and B times A equal the identity. So any set with a binary operation that satisfies these three properties is called a group. And finally, we say that the group G is abelian or commutative. They mean the same thing. If the order in which you add or multiply doesn't matter, A times B equals B times A for all A and B in the group. So that's the definition of a group and an abelian group. And what's an isomorphism? We say that the group G is isomorphic oh, just one second is isomorphic Sorry. So the group G is isomorphic to the group G prime if there exists a function F from G to G prime that satisfies the following properties. So such that um, F of AB is F of A times f of b, let me write this carefully, 
So if I take two elements, A, B in the group, if I look at F of the product, A times B, that's the product of F and A and F of B for all A and B in the group. And F is one to one and on to. So this is the definition of an abelian group. And this is the definition of an isomorphism of groups. Okay. So you can't solve the problem if you don't know what the words mean precisely. And these are the precise definitions of group, abelian group, and isomorphism. Okay. So you need that before you start to solve the problem. All right. So let's solve the problem. Suppose we let G be the set of all matrices of the following form. The two by two matrices, one down the diagonal, zero here and some number A here for any integer A. So for example, if you let A equal to zero, you get the matrix one, zero, zero, one is in G. If you let A equal minus seven, you have the matrix one minus seven, zero, one is in G. So for any integer A, positive, negative, or zero, you look at this matrix and you look at the set of all those matrices, okay? So that's the group that we're looking at. So G is the set of all these matrices. And we want to prove this is an abelian group. So let's just check all the properties. First of all, you have to know how to multiply matrices. These are simple matrices, I mean, simple form. If you multiply these two matrices with A here and B here, you get one zero, A plus B there, and one there. So this is this, the group operation is matrix multiplication. And when you multiply two matrices of this form, you get another matrix of this form. So G is closed under the binary operation. of matrix multiplication. So let's check the properties. First of all, let's check associativity. So you take one A zero one times one B zero one and you multiply that together, and then you multiply the product by one C zero one, right? So when you multiply these two together, you get one A plus B zero one times one C zero one. This is one zero one. And what do you get up here? This plus this, A plus B plus C. So when you multiply in this order, this is what you get. Suppose that we look at one A zero one, and we multiply that by the product of one B zero one and one C zero one. So it's this times this product. This product is one, sorry, there's an A here, one B plus C, zero one. When you multiply these, you get one zero one. And here you get A plus B plus C. So in the first case, this is the integer in the upper right hand corner. In the second case, this is the integer in the 
upper right hand corner. But addition of integers is associative. A plus B plus C is A plus B plus C. Okay. You use this fact since elementary school. So these are equal. So this is a proof that matrix multiplication is associative in this set. Okay. Any questions about this? These are all the things you have to do to solve the problem. This is just the first of a lot of steps. Okay. All right. That's associativity. What about an inverse? Well, the identity matrix I, which is one, zero, zero, one, is in G. This is just the matrix where A is zero. So this is in G. And you can check, or let's call it E. So it's, well, I'll call it I. This is it's more traditional. So if you take the matrix um, A equal to one, A, zero, one, a times I, and A plus zero is zero, is A. I times A, zero plus A is A. So we have that AI equals IA equals A for every matrix A in the group. So this is a proof that the group G contains the identity. This is the identity. Suppose we take A equal to one A zero one, and we let B be equal to one minus A zero one. This is in the group, this is in the group, A B, is one a zero one zero one minus a zero one this is one a minus a zero one a minus a is zero so a b is the identity and if i multiply in the opposite order one minus a zero one one a zero one this is one minus a plus a zero one which is also one zero zero one. So we have that A B equals B A is the identity and B, I can call it A inverse, is the inverse of A. So I just showed that this set of matrices with matrix multiplication is a group. Associative activity holds, there's an inverse, there's just an identity and there's an inverse. And what about to show it's a billion? Well, if we have A times B, suppose A is one A zero one and B is one B zero one. This is one A plus B zero one. But again, you know, from elementary school, that A plus B equals B plus A. Addition of integers is, associated, is a commutative. So this is one B zero one times one A zero one, which is B times A. A B equals B A. So therefore G is an abelian group. So this was the first half of the problem. Prove that this set of matrices G is an abelian group. Right. Any questions about this? All right. And the second part is to prove that G 
is isomorphic to Z. And this symbol is the symbol for isomorphism. So I have to define a function F from this group to this group that's one to one and onto and satisfies the appropriate relation. So define a function F from G to Z as follows. F of the matrix one A zero one is just gonna be the integer A. This is an element of Z. So this is in the group G. You look at the upper right hand corner, that integer A, you let F of this matrix be equal to that integer A. So this is a function from G to Z. And F is one to one and on to. If you have two different numbers in the upper right hand corner, then you're sent, then the matrices are sent to two different integers in Z. So it's one to one. And if you take any number A and Z, this matrix is in G and F of this is equal to A. So this function is one to one and on to. So what do we have to check? The last thing to check is must prove that for all A and B in the group, F of A times B is equal to F of A. But see, in the group Z, the operation is addition. So this would be F of A plus F of B. Because Z, this is a group under addition. This is what we would call an additive billion group. This operation here is matrix multiplication. This operation here is just addition of integers. Okay, so this is what we have to prove. So how do we prove this? Suppose we let A be the matrix one A zero one and B the matrix one B zero one. So A times B is the matrix one A plus B zero one. So F of AB is A plus B. F of A is little a, F of B is little b. So this is the same as F of capital A plus F of capital B. So this property is satisfied. Ooh, okay. So we solved the problem. And it requires more than just one simple step, but that's what you do in mathematics. Every step is simple, it's just a lot of steps. Any questions about this? Okay, good. So the lesson for today is the Euclidean algorithm. So this is section 1.3, the Euclidean algorithm. And what are called continued fractions.
So the Euclidean algorithm is a method to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers. And it was, you find it in Euclid, so this is 2,500 years old. But in fact, if you take a computer programming class, usually one of the problems you have to solve is to write a program to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers using the Euclidean algorithm. And the Euclidean algorithm is really very, very, very efficient. So how does it work? Um, so suppose we take two integers, a and b, with b positive. We want to compute a comma b. This is the standard notation for the greatest common divisor of A and B. And the algorithm goes as follows. Um, maybe before I write it down in general, I'll do an example. Suppose we let A equal 574 and B equal 252. So the algorithm consists in use the division algorithm I might say effectively in an intelligent way. So suppose you take 574 and divide by 5252. So 574 is 252 times two. You see, this is 504. So this leaves a remainder of 70, right? So this two, when you divide, is the quotient. The 70, when you divide, is the remainder. Now take 252 and divide it by 70. Take the number 252 and divide by the remainder. This goes three times, that's 210, and it leaves a remainder of 42. So here's what I divide it by, and this was the remainder. So then I take this and divide by the remainder. This is what I get. Then take 70 and divide by the remainder 42. 70 is 42 times 1 plus 28. So I divide it by 42 and I got a remainder of 28. Take 42 and divide by 28, that's 28 times one plus 14. Take 28, divide it by 14. That goes in twice exactly, the remainder is zero. So, Let's look at this for a moment. If you have a common divisor, D of 574 and 252, then D also divides this difference, so D divides 70. But if D divides 252 and 70, then D divides 42. If D divides 70 and 42, it divides 28. If D divides 42, two and 28, it divides 14. And 14 divides D. Sorry, and D, so every common divisor of 574 and 252
divides 14. On the other hand, if you have a common, if you have number 14 divides 28, if it divides 14 and 28, it divides 42. If it divides 28 and 42, it divides 70. If it divides 42 and 70, it divides 252. Divide 70 and 252, it divides 74. So if you look at this sequence of equations, every common divisor of 574 and 252 divides 14. Second, 14 divides 574 and 252. Therefore, 14 is the greatest common divisor of 574 and 252. Okay. So I have the sequence of division algorithms. And notice, when I divide 574 by 252, the remainder is less than 252. When I divide 252 by 70, the remainder is less than 70. When I divide 70 by 42, the remainder is less than 42. These remainders are strictly decreasing. They're strictly getting smaller and they're non-negative integers. And if you have a decreasing sequence, a strictly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers, at some point, you have to get to zero. So this algorithm terminates in a finite number of steps. And the last positive remainder before you get the remainder of zero is the greatest common divisor. So this is an example of the Euclidean algorithm. And if we write down the general algorithm, oh, sorry. So are there any questions about this example? It's in the text, so it's easy to study afterwards. But um, in fact, since you have the syllabus, the content of every lecture for the entire semester on the syllabus, uh, it's actually a good thing and a smart thing to try oh. to always read the section of the book in advance of the lecture. So you're a little bit familiar with what you're going to hear, right? The whole semester's lectures are, you know, uh, know exactly what's going on. Okay. Question? Yes, um, the 574 and 252. Wait, wait, no, uh, just one second. I, I find it for some reason very hard to hear. Let me try something else. Uh, Yeah, go ahead. Can you repeat what you said? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm very curious uh, why the devices are prime numbers. Two, three, one, one, two. That's just Both. a coincidence. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, they don't have to be prime numbers. I mean, that's a very nice observation, but that's just a peculiarity of this example. In general, they're not prime numbers. Okay. Professor. Yeah, another question? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, the, this homework is due today, uh, but we just like having the lecture for this homework. Uh, um. I don't think so. so uh, according to Blackboard, it's supposedly 1.3 is, is due today. So it, it is possible like to move it to Wednesday since we just haven't the lesson. Oh, I, I'm sorry. So if you look at the syllabus, it has, like for example, for today, it says homework, page 21, numbers one to five. But that only means those are the homework problems associated with this lecture. But it's not that they're due today. 
If you look at the assignment section on Blackboard, it has the dates when each assignment is due. So this won't be due for another week or two. Right. So where on the syllabus, it has the homework for each section, um, but, it, but it, I certainly never expect you to be able to do the homework, to turn in the homework before the lecture. So the homework is actually due maybe probably next week, not today. But the assignment um, section of Blackboard should have the homework for each assignment, what problems it covers, and when it's due. But it's certainly not due today. You don't have to worry about that. OK, thank you, Professor. So the Euclidean algorithm. Yeah. I see someone um, posted that the homework is actually due a week from today. It's due the 20th, which makes more um, sense. Professor? Yes. So there's no homework due today because on Blackboard, it said that the homework is due today. The homework for what section? I'll give a second. Let me check that again. It was homework two. The homework 1.2 and 1.3 are due today. Yes, they are due to today before 11.59. Um, 1.2 we already did it, but 1.3 right. we're so just I, I will I will change that. But let's say you have let's say they're really due a week from today. They're doing okay, thank so you. I'll change it to next Monday. Thank you, you so much. Time to study this material and learn it. Um, and also you know that uh, there's CUNY is closed Wednesday and Thursday, so we don't have a lecture on Wednesday. The next lecture after today is a week from today. And then we're back on the normal Monday, Wednesday schedule. Okay. So the Euclidean algorithm is used to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers, A and B. So A and B are integers. Z is the set of integers. And A can be positive, negative, or zero but let's say B is always positive. So the algorithm goes as follows. Suppose we let R naught equal A and R1 equal B. So you know when you do the division algorithm, you would say if you're going to divide A by B, A would be equal to B times some quotient plus the remainder. So, our A is R0, our B is R1. Let's call the quotient Q0 and the remainder R2. And what we know about the, so this is the division algorithm. So the remainder R2 is greater than or equal to zero, but strictly less than R1, right? by the division algorithm. So, and what can we observe if you look at this? If D divides R0 and R1, then D divides R0 minus R1 Q0, which is R2. So if D divides R0 and R1, then D divides R2. On the other hand, if D divides R1 and R2, then D divides R0, which is R1 Q0 plus R2. So the set of common divisors of R0 and R1 is the same as the set of common divisors of R1 and R2. So the greatest common divisor of R0 and R1 is going to equal 
the greatest common divisor of R1 and R2. So, which is AB, right? Of course, A is R0 and B is R1. So this is the fundamental observation. This is the fundamental observation. And now we repeat this. Take R1 and divide by R2. So repeat. But with R1 divided by R2 instead of R0 divided by R1. So R1 is R2 times some quotient Q1 plus a remainder R3. And the remainder R3 is strictly less than R2 and greater than or equal to zero. And of course, R2 is less than R1. So these numbers are decreasing. And the greatest common divisor of R1 and R2 is the same as the greatest common divisor of R2 and R3, which is again, the greatest common divisor of A and B. By the way, notice if R2 is zero, R1 divides R0. So if R2 were zero, the greatest common divisor would be R1. If R3 equals zero, then AB, which is the greatest common divisor of R2 and R3, if R3 is zero, the greatest common divisor of R2 and zero is R2. So if R3 is zero, then this last positive remainder is the greatest common divisor. If R3 is not zero, that means it's at least one, then divide, then repeat. This time you divide R2 by R3. R2 is R3 times some quotient Q2 plus a remainder R4, where R4 is greater than or equal to zero and strictly less than what you're dividing by R3, which in turn is less than R2 and less than R1. And the greatest common divisor of R3 and R4 is equal to AB. And you continue this process as long as you have a positive remainder in your division steps. So let's just sort of look at this now. Suppose we let A equal R0, B equal R1, which is some positive number. We let R0 be equal to R1 Q0 plus R2. If R2 is positive, divide R1 by R2, you get a remainder R3. If R3 is positive, to divide R2 by R3, you get a remainder R4. And as you do this, notice you have the remainder R2 is less than R1. R3 is less than R2. R4 is less than R3. But all of these numbers are greater than or equal to zero. So this sequence of remainders is strictly decreasing. And at some point, you have to get to zero. Suppose as you, as you do this, suppose you've done this, you have, let's say, some R sub n minus two which is R sub N minus one Q N minus two plus a remainder R sub N. Which is positive, but you can not have this sequence, this decreasing sequence of integers going on forever. A strictly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers eventually has to get to zero. And so let's say that when you divide Rn minus one by Rn, you get a remainder of zero. 
is, well, would this would be the our n plus first remainder is zero. And what we have is that the greatest common divisor of a and b, which is the greatest common divisor of r0 and r1, is the greatest common divisor of r1 and r2 and so forth, the greatest common divisor of q sub n minus, of r sub n minus one, r sub n minus one, r sub n minus two, and r sub n minus one, is the greatest common divisor of r sub n minus one and r sub n, but r sub n divides r sub n minus one if this remainder is zero. I mean, eventually you get to zero equals r sub n. So what the Euclidean algorithm says is the GCD of a and b is the last positive remainder in the Euclidean algorithm. Okay. That is, that's the Euclidean algorithm. Let's do another Example. Suppose I want to compute using the Euclidean algorithm, the greatest common divisor of 35 and 91. So I take 91, if I divide it by 35, I get a quotient of two and a remainder of 21. If I take 35 and divide it by 21, I get a quotient of one and a remainder of 14. If I take 21 and divide it by 14, I get a quotient of one and a remainder of seven. And see, notice these remainders. I have 35, 21 is less than 35, 14 is less than 21, seven is less than 14. I take 14, I divide it by seven, I get a remainder of zero. So the last positive remainder is seven. So this proves that the greatest common divisor of 35 and 91 is seven. And of course you can check if you divide seven into 35, it goes exactly five times. If I divide seven into 91, it goes 13 times. So you see seven is a common divisor of 35 and 91, and it is the greatest common divisor. Any questions about this? So we proved the theorem that the GCD of A and B can always be written as some linear combination of A and B for some not necessarily unique integers X and Y. So let's try and write seven as a linear combination of 35 and 91. That would be hard to do, but if you have the Euclidean algorithm, you can work backwards. So you just have to watch carefully what I do and then you'll understand the process. Seven is 21 minus 14 times one from this equation. But from this equation, 14 is 35 minus 21, which is 
21 times 2 minus 35. And from this equation, 21 is 91 minus 35 times 2. So if I plug that in for 21, I get this times 2 minus 35. This is 91 times 2. This is minus 4 times 35, minus 5 times <coughs> 35. So this is 7 is 91x plus 35y, where x is 2 and y is minus 5. So I use the Euclidean algorithm to express the greatest common divisor of 91 and 35 as a linear combination of 91 and 35. This just check that the arithmetic works. 91 times two is 182. 35 times minus five is minus 175. 182 minus 175 is seven. So this really is correct. Okay, now we can also use the Euclidean algorithm to calculate what is called the simple continued fraction of a rational number. So a simple continued fraction, I mean, doesn't necessarily look so simple. So what is called a simple continued fraction, it's a fraction, you might call it a complex fraction if you like, um, suppose we let a0, a1, a2, up to a sub capital N be integers. a0 might be negative or zero, but um, a1 up to a n are all positive. Then the simple continued fraction is the following fraction, it's a0 plus one over a1 plus one over a2 plus one over a3 plus down to finally a sub n. So let's look at an example. Suppose I take two, three, five. What is the simple continued fraction? It's two plus one over three plus one over five. Right? That's it. What is this number? This is two plus one over three plus one over five is 16 over five, which is two plus five over 16, which is 37 over 16. So this simple continued fraction, if I did my arithmetic correctly, is 37 over 16. <clears throat> Suppose I take the continued fraction 1, 1, 1, 1. That's 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1. Now, it's probably not too much to expect that uh, by the time you've gotten to an advanced math class, you can do fractions. So let's try and calculate this. This is one plus one over, one plus one over, and this is just one plus one, that's two. This is one plus one over one plus a half is three halves. One over, <coughs> one plus one over three halves 
is two thirds. One plus two thirds is five thirds. So this continued fraction is five thirds. So continued fractions are nice things to know about. They're actually quite interesting. And it turns out, I mean, suppose we want to do this. If I give you the continued fraction, in principle, doing arithmetic, you can see what simple fraction is equal to. But suppose I gave you a fraction like 5 thirds, and I said, write this as a simple continued fraction. That would be hard to do. But it's only hard to do, but it's not hard to do if you know the division algorithm. So here's the following problem. Compute a simple continued fraction for 91 over 35. So to do that, let's go back. This was our Euclidean algorithm to calculate the greatest common divisor of 91 and 35. From this first equation, so let me just recopy this. So I had 91 is 35 times two plus 21. 35 is 21 times one plus 14. 21 is 14 times one plus seven. And 14 was seven times two. This was the Euclidean algorithm. So according to this, <clears throat> 91 over 35, just divide by 35, is two plus 21 over 35, which is two plus one over 35 over 21. From this equation, 35 over 21 is one plus 14 over 21. And 14 over 21 is one over 21 over 14. 21 over 14 is seven. So 91 over 35, this is the simple continued fraction, two, one, seven. Oh, sorry, two, one, uh, something's not right here. Um, yeah, I should have done it like this. I mean, I really wanna follow the, So 21 over 14, 21 over 14 is one plus seven over 14. Which is two plus one over one plus one over one plus one over 14 over seven, one over two. So, 2, 1, 1, 2. That's the continued fraction for 91 over 35. <clears throat> and if you look at these numbers, these are exactly the quotients in the Euclidean algorithm. The remainders gave us the greatest common divisor, but the quotients give us the continued fraction. Let's look at the first example we did. Um, so the first example, we calculated the greatest common divisor of 574 and 252. 
So let me just copy that down again. So when I apply the Euclidean algorithm to 574 and 252, the quotient is two and the remainder is seven. 252 divided by, remainder is 70. 252 divided by 70 gives me a quotient of three and a remainder of 42. 70 divided by 42 gives me a quotient of one and a remainder of 28. 42 divided by 28 gives me a quotient of one and a remainder of 14. 28 divided by 14 gives me a quotient of two and a remainder of zero. So this is the Euclidean algorithm. And from this, we saw that the greatest common divisor of 574 and 252 is 14. Let's just double check this. If you divide 14 into 574, this goes three, no, this goes four times. Four times 14 is 56. 14, one, 14. So 574 is 14 times 41. 14 into 252, this goes once. 14 into 112. Okay. 112. This goes eight times. Eight four is a 32. So 252 is 14 times 18. So we see that 14 is this common divisor of 574 and 252. And the quotient, and this is the, these are the quotients. Okay. Suppose we want to write 14 as a linear combination with integer coefficients of 574 and 252. Again, we use the Euclidean algorithm just working backwards. So 14 is 42 minus 28. 28 is 70 minus 42. This is 42 times two minus 70. 42 is 252 minus 70 times three. So 42 is 252 minus 70 times three times two minus 70. This is 252 times two minus six minus one plus 70 times minus seven. 70 is 574 minus 252 times two. So this is 252 times two plus 70, which is 574 minus 252 times two times minus seven. So this is 574 times minus seven plus 252, I have minus 14, no, minus times minus, I have plus 14 plus two times 16. So if I did my arithmetic correctly, this is 14, as a linear combination of 574 and 252. Let me see if I did this correctly. 252 times 16, six twos are 12, it's like 15, 12, 252 
2304. 574 times seven, this is four, seven fours are 28, 49 and two is 51, four, oh, uh-huh. And 4032 minus 4018 is 14. So, This checks. So, so my Euclidean algorithm, first of all, it gave me the greatest common divisor. Second, it allows me to express the greatest common divisor of the linear combination of the two numbers whose greatest common divisor it is. And then the third use is to compute continued fraction. So suppose I want to compute the continued fraction for 574 over 252. So let me, get this on the screen. From the first equation, 574, Divide up by 252 is 2 plus 70 over 252, which is 2 plus 1 over 252 over 70. 252 over 70 is 3 plus 42 over 70, which is two plus one over three plus, and 42 over 70 is one over 70 over 42. Two plus one over three plus one over 70 over 42 is one plus 28 over 42. is two plus one over three plus one over one plus one over 42 over 28. From this equation, forty two over twenty eight is one plus fourteen over twenty eight. This is two plus one over three plus one over one plus one over 28 over 14. Two plus one over one plus one over one plus one over one plus one over two, that's it. That's the continued fraction. So 574 over 252 is the continued fraction 23112. And again, if you go back and you look at the Euclidean algorithm, what were the quotients at each stage? Two, three, one, one, two. Two, three, one, one, two. Uh, one observation. 
this is re represent backwards because you, you are using those bracket bracket special bracket for vectors. No, it's not a vector. It's just okay. it's okay. just a sequence of numbers. It's I mean, there's no reason to look at it as a vector. All right, well, here's an example for you to do right now. Why should I have all the fun? Um, so use the Euclidean algorithm. First, to find the greatest common divisor of the numbers that say A is equal to, um, I'll just make up some numbers, 297 and B equal to, um, Three fifty-two. So this is for something for you to do right now. So spend a couple minutes, and then I'll do it also. But first, use the Euclidean algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of these two numbers. Second, to find integers x and y such that the greatest common divisor of A and B is 297x plus 352. Actually, I should have done this in the opposite order. I like A to be the bigger one. So A will be 352 and B will be 297. And three, to compute the simple continued fraction, of the rational number 352 over 297. So spend a minute or two and solve the problem. Anyone get the greatest common divisor yet? 11. Yes. So the next step in the division in the Euclidean algorithm, 297, if you divide by 55, what is the quotient? Uh, 2 plus 555. Five, five, five. Let's see, so five times 55 is 275. So what is the remainder? 22. Okay. And then you divide 55 by 22. And what is the quotient? Two. And the remainder? 11. And you divide 22 by 11. What is the quotient? Two. And the remainder? Zero. So the last positive remainder is 11. So the greatest common divisor of 352 and 297 is 11. And if you want to find X and Y such that 11, I should have written it the other way, but it doesn't matter. Um, such that 11 is 
352x plus 297y, you would say what? 11 is 55 minus 22 times 2. But from this equation, 22 is 297 minus 55 times 5 times 2, which is 55. And here I have minus 55 times 5 times 2 is 10. So this is 11 times 55. I have 55 times 11 plus 297 times minus 2. And from this, 55 is 352 minus 297 times 11 plus 297 times minus 2. So this is 352 times 11 plus 297 minus 2 minus 11 times minus 13. So if my arithmetic is correct, this is x and this is y. And what would the simple continued fraction be? 352 over 297. These are the partial quotients, 1522, 1522. Two. So if you were to write this out, this would be 1 plus 1 over 5 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2. So this is the simple continued fraction for these numbers. Questions about this? Hmm. So this is really very important. Now, let's do one more example, and then we will be done for this morning. Use the Euclidean algorithm. To compute the greatest common divisor, I'm just going to write down two numbers and hope they're not too bad. Um, seven, nine, three, eight. And um, three, two, one, six. The GCD. So A is 7,938. B is 3,216. Right? So again, you would start off, take 7938 divided by 3,216. That goes in twice, plus you have some remainder and Keep on going. Hmm. 
So can you repeat your question, please? Yes, so uh, for example, for the first homework, uh, not the first homework, but the first uh, lecture, we talked about the, the division theorem, correct? The division algorithm. Uh, division algorithm, sorry. Yeah. Then for homework, we, uh, just a second. So for homework, we had to, let's say, find all the divisors for a certain number. Yeah, something like that. So I, I'm, I'm, I mean, only me. I'm kind of weirded out by it because I didn't really see the connection to the lecture. Maybe it's I didn't see it. I just kind of find it weird. Well, the connection is that we're interested in divisors of integers. I mean, like if I give you a number, <clears throat> what are its divisors? If I give you two numbers, what is the greatest common divisor? We're talking, so <clears throat> this whole first part of the course is about divisors of numbers. Okay. And <clears throat> a lot of this is what you might have done in elementary school. Like <clears throat> in elementary school, they might have talked about like divisor trees. So you have a number like uh, <clears throat> 120. So you could factor that as four times 30. <clears throat> and then four is two times two. And 30 is, um, I don't know, five times six. And then six is three times two. So, Here you have this tree where you've broken down the numbers until you can't divide anymore. And these all turn out to be prime numbers, but this is just, <clears throat> this is elementary school, right? Just finding divisors of numbers. And that's all we're doing in here. Right, because and I just wanted to ask. Of having um, paper and pencil and time, <clears throat> and do trial divisions and so forth until you get a result. Okay, I just wanted to ask because you know when, because uh, finding the greatest common divisor is like you say, the elementary algebra stuff. So I was kind of on my guard because I didn't know if it was supposed to be easy. Well, yeah. <clears throat> You know, this is number theory is about playing with numbers. So those first couple of problems to find all divisors of 20, that's easy, right? The positive divisors are one, two, four, five, and 20, but they can negative also minus one, minus two, minus four, minus five, also 10. So these are all the divisors of 20. <clears throat> you know, you don't need to, you know, go to college to solve this problem, but it's still a nice thing to be able to try to do. So, yeah. Anyway, um, what for 7,938 and 3,216, what is the greatest common divisor? Did anyone get to calculate this? Eight. What is the answer? Six. Sorry? I just didn't hear what you said. Six. Six. All right. Well, let's see. If I divide 3,216 into this, this is 6432. So I think the remainder is 15.06? Yes. Okay. And then I take 32.16. I divide by 1,506. That goes twice. This is 3,012.
This is 3,000. See, 3,012. That's 204? Yes. And then if I take 1,506 and divide by 204, this looks like it goes in seven times. This would be 1,428. So I think this leaves a remainder of 78. Is that OK? Yes. And then 204, if I divide it by 78, this goes twice. This is 156. 150, uh, these are a remainder of 48. If I divide 78 by 48, that goes once, and leaves a remainder of 30. 48 divided by 30 has a quotient of 1 and a remainder of 18. 30 divided by 18 goes quotient of 1 and a remainder of 12. A lot of steps here. 18 divided by 12 goes once and leaves a remainder of 6. And 12 divided by 6 leaves a remainder of 0. So the last positive remainder is 6. And the greatest common, so the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is 6. And if we wrote this fraction as a continued, as a simple continued fraction, 7, 9, 38 over 32, 16, it would be kind of complicated. And if we wanted to compute the x and the y such that 6 was 7938x plus 3216y, that would also be hard. Uh, not hard, but a lot of work. And that just teaches us that sometimes you have to do a lot of work. All right, that's, that's all there is to it. Any questions about that? So this is really very important to learn. And the more examples you can do using the Euclidean algorithm and continued fractions and so forth, the better. Um, and no, that's it. Any questions about this? Professor. Yeah. Before we leave, can we go over problem five from page 22? Page 22. Problem five. Yes. yes. So so let's just look at an example. So we already had worked out. That 574 over 252. This was the continued fraction 23112. That meant this was 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2. All right. Now, if I look at just this part, this denominator, 3 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2. This is also a continued fraction. This is the continued fraction 3, 1, 1, 2. So 574 over 252, which is 2, 3, 1, 1, 2, can also be written as 2 plus 1 over this, which is 3, 1, 1, 2. Right. So this is an example of, in section 1.3, exercise 5, this continued fraction, a0, a1, a2, up to a sub n, what does that mean? That's a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 down to 1 over a sub n. 
But if I just look at this part of it, under the one, this is a zero plus one over, and this is the continued fraction for a one, a two, up to a sub n. And that's the proof. Oh my God, like, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, so it's only, no, no, I mean, <laughs> It's not, it looks easy after you figure out how to do it. Yeah. To figure out how to do it can take a very long time, All right? Looking at an example sometimes gives you the idea of how to prove the general case. But, you know, a person could spend, you know, hours until they finally see that this little, step is all you need to do yeah so you can't say oh i should have known that i mean it's you know it's um you only know it after you know it so um <laughs> there's a lot of learning techniques and tricks and whatever you want to call it in number theory to do these problems and a lot of it's just a matter of putting in some time trying one thing after another and failing time after time until finally, by luck or whatever, you sort of figure out what, what works. Yeah, you're right, Professor. Thank you. Okay. So I have a couple of uh, office hours this week. I think there's one this afternoon, one tomorrow evening, I think. I'm not quite sure. Or maybe one this evening and one tomorrow afternoon. And then I'll Wednesday and Thursday, CUNY is closed, but I'll probably also have another uh, office hour on Friday if you have questions about homework and so forth. Okay, if there's um, nothing else, so then we will quit for the day. Um, professor? Sorry, is there a professor, question? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you please um, show me the book, please? The book? Yeah. All right, well, this is the book, but I think I posted uh, chapter one, what we're doing now, on Blackboard already. I know. I saw it. I just wanted to buy the book. Thank you. Okay. Stay well, everyone. Bye.